is joint. Thank you. Lovely to have you all here. Um, we've got a packed program today, um, as I explained earlier on. And um, great, brilliant. So I'd like to introduce our lovely lead, um, Sarah Stewart Smith, and she will be talking about um, acute management in adult with sickle cell disease. Hi, Sarah. Are you here? Are you on yet? Yes, can you not see my slide? Oh, yes, I can. Yep, thank good. you. All right, I'll let you go. Brilliant. All right. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so we've got a whole day of sickle cell. Um, so I'm going to start off with a slight overview and then talk about some acute complications. So uh, treatments in the main that what we've had historically are hydroxycarbamide and transfusion, but we're going to hear later in the morning about some of the more uh, some of the newer treatments and then management of the acute sickle pain episode is um, it's going to be a big part of the talk. A little bit about care plans and acute sickle complications, including infection, gallbladder issues, acute chest syndrome, prior pism, aplastic crisis and eye problems. So uh, a lot to get through. So sickle cell disease. This is a lovely picture, a sort of scanning electron micrograph showing um, the usual arrangement of biconcave discs, which are the, almost the same diameter as some of the tiny capillaries in the body. Um, oh gosh. Um, and you can imagine they're very flexible and good at exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide, etc. But these are sickle cells which are rigid. Gosh, everything's going off. Uh, are rigid and sticky and get stuck in, in sort of microcirculation. And you can see how they would create issues. So um, when we talk about sickle cell disease, there are various structural variants. So SS is the commonest. SC, we think of a slightly milder phenotype, although this isn't always um, the case. Do you think you could answer this phone? Sorry, it's just apheresis. Um, we've got HBS beta thalassemia, which can be a very severe form of its zero and a, um, a milder form of its, if there's some A hemoglobin produced, but they're both, they're all lifelong disorders. Um, which are inherited. And it's a really simple point mutation, the beta globin gene, which causes sickle. Most of the time, the cells go around in these nice biconcave discs, Hello. but particularly when there's dehydration, infection, and hypoxia. There you go. Viv, can you just call back later? We're in the middle of a talk. It's just I've only got my phone's broken, it's always speaker form. Okay, so. Um, so our patients tell us that their emergency experiences are really poor. Um, they have a really common presentation as acute severe pain, but the potentially fatal acute chest syndrome can complicate a pain episode. So there's a tendency among doctors and nurses to think, oh gosh, it's just pain, they'll be fine. But actually we always have in the background of our minds this worry that they could get this fatal acute chest complication. Right. It's really important to remember that our patients are asplenic, so they're at risk of overwhelming sepsis. Patients particularly mention stigma, accusations of drug seeking. So whenever you're dealing with a patient, try really hard to avoid any of those accusations. You could report any concerns to the team and we'll try and deal with it sensitively with the psychologists. There's a lot of fear. I think we underestimate fear. These patients, it's an inherited genetic disorder, so they might have had family members die or become really unwell during a, a sickle pain crisis. So really important to address the fear and, and to be reassuring. They also report lack of empathy and just basic needs. They've been told all their lives they've got to drink lots of water and that's because patients have a um, reduced concentration capacity. So they produce more dilute high volumes of urine. So they've been told all their lives they've got to drink lots of water. So if you put them there and there's no water jug, they're going to feel much more distressed than the average patient. They've got to keep drinking. They've got to avoid dehydration. It's been drummed into them in a lifetime and they've got to have adequate blankets so that they're not cold. And they 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 explain that staff are often quite slow to give pain relief. So try and try and uh, be prompt in dealing with them. You could say, why do we need to know about sickle? Well, because it's really, really common in the areas that we work in. So there's more than 4000 individuals. Uh, with sickle cell in southeast London. Most of them have SS and the main issues with SS are pain, acute chest syndrome, chronic lung, liver and kidney complications, stroke, leg ulcers and priapism. So we're going to go through all of those. SC is a is a smaller group of patients and it's predominantly eye and, and sort of joint issues that they're troubled with. And then we've got sickle trait, which doesn't uh, present with acute pain. 
and hereditary persistence of fetal haemoglobin, which is rarely symptomatic. So we've got probably it's more like um, 14,000 people living with sickle cell disease in England, and that's much more than, say, uh, cystic fibrosis, which is a comparable genetic disorder. And life expectancy is getting better and better, which, which is fabulous. Um, so in the 70s up to 14, in the 90s, 45, and the new cohorts coming through probably closer to sort of 65, 67 years. And why are people living longer? I'm sure it's a combination of things like early diagnosis and vaccination, because people used to die in childhood of, of sort of sepsis and um, were sort of diagnosed late safe blood transfusion, improved medical care and education, and probably the effect of hydroxycarbamide, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. So here's a lovely graph showing survival going up and up. And it's great to see that now 99% survive to adulthood. And we've got a really nice median life expectancy in our sickle cohort around Kings. That's a fairly local cohort. So here's another very simple idea of pathogenesis. So you can see in the situation in most people, you have these biconcave flexible discs flowing freely within a small capillary, and you can see the haemoglobin. Whereas in a situation where somebody has sickle cell disease and perhaps has hypoxia or dehydration, that these heme, heme have formed strands and they've distorted the cell, it's become rigid and it's blocking little blood vessels. And this blockage and breakage of red cells also leads to anemia. So I might make a red cell in the last 90 to 100 days or so, whereas somebody with sickle cell, their cells might last 10 to 20 days. So you can imagine they've got to keep churning them out. And if for any reason they get sick or unwell or run out of things like folate, they could um, become very anemic very rapidly. And you can see that this lack of blood flow and lack of oxygen release, oxygen availability to tissues can cause damage and pain. And over a lifetime, organ damage in, in really every organ of the body. So hydroxycarbamide is in many ways the ideal medicine for, hydroxy, for uh, sickle cell disease. It's got about five mechanisms of action, but the, probably the most important is this increase in fetal haemoglobin production. So we're all born with fetal haemoglobin, but um, at about sort of three to six months of age, we switch on our adult haemoglobin and I switched on mostly AA. Well, I've probably got a tiny bit of fetal haemoglobin going along, probably less than 1%. And people with sickle cell um, switched perhaps to SS and they've got a little bit of fetal haemoglobin in the background. But hydroxycarbamide increases that and fetal haemoglobin gets in the way of those long crystals forming and, and helps people avoid uh, their cells from sickling it. Hydroxycarbamide improves the red cell hydration. There's an increase in mean cell volume. It reduces the neutrophils. You might think, gosh, that's a bad thing. And they've got, you know, we've already said that they're at risk of infection. But too many neutrophils are big, sticky cells and they slow the circulation in the microvasculature and that can lead to the oxygenation and, and sickling. It also modifies endothelial cell interactions. Later on, we're going to hear about crisanlizumab, which is a P-selectin inhibitor, and that's something which makes blood vessels and cells less sticky. But hydroxycarbamide, to some extent, um, um, does that and it also acts as a nitric oxide donor, nitric oxide being a chemical which opens up blood vessels and improves flow, particularly useful in, in the lungs and in pulmonary hypertension. And it's really lovely to show patients how their blood can change. So this is a typical patient before hydroxycarbamide and this is after treatment for uh, around a year. So it's a slow effect but you can see the haemoglobin is gradually improved, the mean cell volume is gradually increased, and the fetal haemoglobin is, has, has come up. And sometimes we get excellent responses, near normal um, or even normal uh, full blood counts. Could somebody just go on to mute, NO, thank you, um, and fetal haemoglobins that can go up to 30%. There are a few side effects, and patients worry about the side effects. Once we're adults and we're Born. We have very few things that need to keep on proliferating, but one of them are nails and skin and hair, so it can affect those a little bit, and particularly slight um, increased pigmentation of the nails is common. Women are born with all their eggs, but men have to keep going with spermatogenesis, so making sperm, so their sperm counts can, can reduce. And in about four out of five men, when they stop hydroxycarbamide, they come right back up to where they started. But in about, there's very tiny data on this, but about one in five um, might have uh, a more permanent reduction in sperm count. And that does really worry the men. Just going to quickly shut the door. Uh, we offer people under 40 sperm banking on the NHS. 
um, but but young chaps are quite embarrassed and they don't always want to take that up. Occasional gut discomfort, particularly on an empty stomach, so we take say so take it after food at night. And the way it works is this transient reversible bone marrow suppression. But obviously, if that's too um, significant, then um, that can cause problems. So I'll come into that. But blood monitoring is an important part of it. So really, we ought to be thinking about hydroxycarbamide for all our patients with SS or SB to zero, and certainly considering it for other patients if they're running into issues. So I'm going to swiftly move on to care plans. Every institution will have their own version of a care plan. This is King's version, but I think it's important that in an emergency you can identify the patient's underlying diagnosis. So here you see they've got SC, their comorbidities. So we've got this one has had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and they've got some sickle retinopathy. We can identify some steady state values so we know how unwell they are. Is this different to their usual? So this person has a steady state hemoglobin of 110, oxygen saturations of 98. We want to know their emergency analgesia and we've got this person having morphine sulfate oral solution 10 milligrams stat and then two to four hourly and also their usual pain relief. And, and any regular medication that they're taking at home. We also add in their immunisation details um, and there's a section for sort of additional information which can be quite useful in more complex patients. This is a very simple one. Right, so I've talked about hydroxycarbamide. Um, I want to now just talk a tiny bit about blood transfusion. I'm not going to cover this very heavily because it's kind of going to come up later in your day, but our patients' haemoglobins typically run between sort of 60 and 90 or 60 and 100. So the transfusion triggers are slightly different for the general population. But somebody with a haemoglobin below 60, particularly if they were symptomatic or if it was below their he baseline haemoglobin, and if their reticulocyte count, which is a part of the, um, tells us how quickly they're making red cells, so reticulocytes are sort of young red cells. So if they're not churning them out rapidly, we know that their red cell lifespan is shortened. There's a worry that their haemoglobin will drop. So somebody with a low haemoglobin and a low or normal reticulocyte count might be somebody you're starting to discuss um, blood transfusion with. Delayed transfusion reactions are, are really important in everybody, but they're particularly important in sickle cell disease. And um, some of our patients have had multiple transfusions and med made red cell alloantibodies. That's just antibodies against other people's blood groups. Obviously, we, you know, we usually talk about ABO blood groups, but there's lots of other lesser blood groups which are important in somebody who's going to be recurrently transfused. And so there can be delays. So you might say, all right, I want blood now. And you might not get blood for 24 to 48 hours if this patient's got very difficult red cell alloantibodies. And sometimes they even need frozen blood sent in from a, a regional centre. So that can obviously take time. Sometimes you need two group and screen samples, one for our on-site lab and one for the regional transfusion lab. There are patients we who have episodes of hyperhemolysis, which is sort of a severe delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. And that's when you might start at a hemoglobin of, say, 60, give a transfusion of three units and end with a hemoglobin of 30. So they're hemolyzing the blood they've been transfused and they're also hemolyzing their own blood. And that can be really dangerous and potentially fatal. And the talk later will we'll discuss that in further detail. There are patients who have religious or personal objections to transfusion and then we have to sort of work around it, often erythropoietin at fairly high doses for a short period of time, hematinic support, so that just means B12, folate and ferret and iron if, if any of those are, are low or um, normal. And then we might think about hydroxycarbamide. In the acute setting, hydroxycarbamide is not particularly helpful, but in the long term setting, it, it's brilliant. So hyperhemolysis, as I say, very rare. Um, it can happen without newly formed or pre previously known red cell alloantibodies. And in that situation, we would tend to avoid future red cell transfusions. And if we really can't avoid them, we will give preemptive intravenous immunoglobulin and methylprednisolone. So we're just trying to sort of calm down their immune system, flood their reticular endothelial system, so it's like spleen and liver to sort of prevent them from being able to get rid of antibody coated red cells. Automated red cell exchange transfusion is a process where um, we can quickly reduce the sickle percentage to quite low levels and um, it's a bit different to a top up transfusion. You can see somebody having an automated red cell transfusion in this picture. You can see it looks a little bit like dialysis. They've got quite wide for access. Um, they're sitting on a machine about two and a half hours. 
their sickle blood will be taken away and replaced with um, AA blood as a sort of continuous process. And often they need kind of eight to 10 units sickle negative. We talked about extended phenotype blood. That just means that we're not just giving ABO compatible, we're giving RH and KEL compatible. So from your perspective, you don't need to know the absolute in and outs of, um, of transfusion, but it's really important to say this is blood for a cross match and it's uh, for a patient with sickle cell disease uh, and it's for a um, red cell exchange transfusion because that will let them select the sickle negative phenotyped red cells. And usually we would say less than seven days old for red cell exchange or less than 10 days old for a top up. At the moment, we're in the middle of an amber alert and um, we're having to accept less than 14 days old blood. There's various indications for a sort of acute automated red cell exchange transfusion and um, an acute chest syndrome is probably one of the commonest. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but if there's severe clinical features and progression despite a simple transfusion, then we'd often go ahead with a red cell exchange transfusion. So we're just literally physically removing the sickled cells and replacing them with cells which can't sickle. Acute multi-organ failure or liver or spleen sequestration, we, we might give an urgent exchange to um, severe sepsis, emergency surgery, elective surgery, if there's, um, you know, individual considerations obviously depends on the surgery and the patient. An acute ischemic stroke would be an indication for a, an urgent automated red cell exchange transfusion, but we've also got lots of patients on primary or secondary prevention. So that's probably the bulk of our patients on exchanges. They've been identified at risk of stroke and they're having an ongoing program to maintain a sickle percentage less than 30 percent to protect their brain from further complications from sickle. We've got people who have recurrent pain episodes and are in the hospital really disrupted to their life and their education and, and their social life and things and their work. And they can be coming in for a red cell exchange, perhaps a little less frequently than those stroke patients. We're just trying to maintain a sickle percentage less than 50 percent to keep them symptomatically well and healthy. And, and similarly, um, if they've had complications in pregnancy or they're um, randomised uh, as part of a trial, they might be having exchanges in pregnancy. And there's other situations such as post kidney or liver transplantation after um, diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension or a sort of temporarily for leg ulcer treatment. So when you're doing a red cell exchange, there's various things to think about. Access is a big one. So really good peripheral veins or a vas cath, you know, which is quite a thick, um, bigger than a sort of central line, often in the groin. Um, there's a think about blood transfusion reactions and availability and transfusion related infection and iron loading. And then the side effects of the actual procedure. So there's uh, a an anticoagulant called citrate, which keeps the blood flowing through all those plastic tubes we're looking at, and that can give people a low calcium and metallic taste. Sometimes people faint if they've got a large volume um, out of their circulation. So I'm going to talk a bit more about pain now. So pain is the commonest reason you'll be called to see a sickle patient, and, and the pain is often really severe and overwhelming and will often require a bolus of opiates um, to get under control. So you'll look on their care plan, but if there's nothing listed or you can't find a care plan, um, then this is a sort of general guide um, of how to manage a pain crisis. But don't forget that a bolus of morphine or oxycodone will have a really short half-life. So an hour or two later, they might be in huge pain again. So once you've given that bolus, then's the time to quickly sit back and assess other things such as getting in some paracetamol, ibuprofen, codeine perhaps, thinking about laxative because they'll inevitably get constipated, anti-sickness, a lot of people get very sick with opiates, itching um, and thromboprophylaxis because these patients are often fairly immobile because they're in lots of pain often in their limbs. There's some very clear nice guidelines for managing a pain episode and I think we should all know them really well, especially with the APPG report into no one's listening, uh, management of acute sickle cell presentations. I think we, we all need to know that uh, we've got to assess the pain, offer analgesia within 30 minutes, make sure that they've had their observations checked because we're particularly wanting to check have they got some other complication going on, have they got a high fever to suggest sepsis, have they got a low oxygen saturation to suggest the chest crisis etc. And anyone with a low oxygen saturation less than 95 uh, or equal to 95 is offered oxygen therapy and if they've got moderate or severe pain that's when they're going to get their bolus of opiate and it can be by many different routes and that will probably be listed on their uh, on their care plan. So we tend to use subcutaneous or oral as the most common. 
here's a really standard pain assessment. Often you don't need to show them anything, just zero to 10, how do you rate your pain? And don't try and sort of negotiate it with them, just take what they've written, they've said and, and record that as their pain. For children, there's a sort of visual analog scale. And every, uh, uh, after 30 minutes, you need to come back and, and ask that question again and try and try and use sort of non-judgmental questions, just how well did that last painkiller work? Do you need more pain relief? The guide suggests um, other steps. So as I was saying earlier, paracetamol and non-steroidals, if they're not contraindicated, um, regular assessment of pain, a second bolus of opiates if required, and regular clinical assessment and monitoring. So I'm going to switch over to, to sepsis and infection. So all our patients we think of as being um, functionally um, hyposplenic. So the spleen we can think of in a really simplistic way of being a sort of sieve that gets rid of encapsulated organisms and malaria. And if you don't have that sieve because it's been blocked up by sickle cells over the years or it's uh, been removed for whatever reason, then you're at risk of overwhelming infection. So a lot of our patients you'll see are on penicillin prophylaxis to prevent infections. They have an enhanced immunization schedule, including five yearly pneumococcal vaccine. But emergency broad spectrum antibiotics could be life saving. And it's particularly uh, these are the precautions. So particularly pneumovax, Hib, uh, meningococcal um, and there's the penicillin prophylaxis. We often do stop prophylaxis at 18 if they're fully vaccinated and they're not really taking it. There's no harm in continuing, but the evidence base is absolutely clear for the under fives. Probably a, a useful intervention um, for children, but in adulthood there isn't there isn't a lot, of, there isn't really evidence to suggest it needs to continue unless they've had their spleen removed. So the sort of organisms they're getting and they won't be carrying a card, but this is what you have to imagine laminated on the forehead of every patient with sickle that they haven't got a functioning spleen. And here's a picture of what I hope most of our spleens look like. Nice, big, juicy, meaty sieve. And this is the little bit of fibrous scar tissue that will be in most patients with sickle cell disease. I'm going to move on now to gall, gallbladder problems. So um, about 80% of our patients will develop gallstones and they're sort of uh, pigment gallstones, little sort of dark bits of grit and they can frustratingly get blocked in the can block various parts of our sort of biliary tract. So here you see one, uh, one in the common bile duct, one in the cystic duct. So um, they can cause irritation of the gallbladder. We've had several patients with gall, gallbladder perforation, even with pus coming out to these sort of anterior abdominal walls. So always be suspicious of the right upper quadrant of a patient with sickle cell disease. Even if they've had their gallbladder taken out, it's still possible to make bits of grit which can, which can block the biliary tract. And often you can see um, jaundice as a sign of that. Uh, quite often you get uh, pain in that area. So an ultrasound scan is a is an investigation that's that's often warranted. Acute chest syndrome, I promised we'd come back to it. So fever, chest pain and difficulty breathing, that makes you think of acute chest syndrome and you don't need to wait for them to go off and have their chest x-ray but if you get your chest x-ray you'll see that there's usually shadows on both lungs. And often what they've come in with is a painful crisis but they've had poor chest expansion. Pain crises often affect the sternum or the ribs and uh, they get atelectasis, so sort of almost crumpled lungs which aren't sort of expanding properly, particularly at the bases. They've got some opiates on board which also can suppress your um, respiratory uh, drive and rate and then they might have had surgery or other, other events and that, that can push you into an acute chest syndrome. So um, really important to act very quickly. So the first things could just be to make sure that you give the patient oxygen and call somebody senior and then we'll be thinking about antibiotics if there's an underlying um, infection which there often is, pain relief which will help with um, chest expansion and often what we'll end up doing is an urgent red cell exchange transfusion with compatible sickle negative red cells but I mean that's a chain of events which needs a cross match sample to valid to be in um, in the lab, we need to get blood available, we need to get access. So all of that will take a little bit more time. So just getting oxygen and pain relief and antibiotics and senior uh, review is, is the first initial steps. And it's really important when you're looking after a patient with sickle cell disease that, that every time you do the OBS, you take off the oxygen and check their observations on room air because, you know, you can mask the fact that they've got developing lung problems because they're on oxygen. So take off the oxygen, see what their, what their observations are on air briefly. 
So there's very clear guidelines for acute chest syndrome as well. So 100% of patients must have clinical observations at least four hourly. When we've audited this, sometimes kind nurses don't want to wake people up in the night because they know their patients are in lots of pain and they finally fall asleep. It's really important to do those night observations. We had a couple of cases where people have deteriorated overnight and it's really clear by missing that early morning observation we've missed that essential time that we could have intervened. So even if you just creep in and pop an oxygen sats machine on a finger you'll get your oxygen saturation and obviously slip the oxygen off while you're doing it just you know at the wall. You can get your sats and pulse um, and that will be a big part of assessing the patient. Um, if the oxygen saturations are less than 94 on air or there's a fall of greater than 3%, then that triggers a medical review and investigations. Even if it's three in the morning, we've got on-site teams all the time. And this is the list of the sort of investigations, which are all fairly obvious. We're quite good at doing that. Um, one of the things in case there's any um, advanced nurse practitioners or junior doctors on the call is a daily chest examination throughout the admission that must be documented. Really helpful if you knew it was clear the day before and now you've got bi-basal crepitations. That's, a, that's an important finding. So um, always listen to the chest and always document it every single day. So treatment is kind of relatively straightforward. So oxygen, IV fluids, pain relief. Incendiospirometry is hard to do when you've got an acute chest syndrome, but it's certainly something that's useful to avoid the onset of acute chest syndrome. So somebody with chest pain, for instance, ribs and sternum, really helpful if you can use an incentospirometer to help them take really big breaths, perhaps 10 times every hour between nine and five um, is, is sort of making them do their own chest physiotherapy, really. Make sure that they're on appropriate antimicrobials, so quite broad spectrum. Bear in mind if they've been taking penicillin anyway, anoxicillin is not likely to have enough um, sensitivity, so coamoxiclav and clarithromycin are often our sort of go-to. Think about blood transfusion an HDU and ITU um, iMobile or whatever your local system is to getting a, an ITU doctor to review. Bronchodilators only really used if there's sort of asthma or wheezing. But if your patients had an episode of acute chest syndrome, it's really fundamental that you've got to offer them hydroxycarbamide treatment once they've recovered. So it's not an acute treatment, but it's something which can prevent a recurrence of an acute chest syndrome in a patient. And every time you're getting an acute chest syndrome, you can imagine that there's damage to the lungs, increased risk of things like pulmonary hypertension, which carry a real po really poor prognosis. So you really do not want to keep on having recurrent acute chest syndromes. Plus they carry a mortality um, at each event. So really important once somebody's flagged themselves as high risk, all the more importance to um, talk them through hydroxycarbamide. Priapism. Um, priapism, so is a sort of painful crisis effect in the penis, and it's it can be really devastating. We've had young men before the age of 20 have severe damage to their penises, and it's often concealed. So young men with nurse, female nurses looking after them might be very, very reluctant to discuss having a, a priapism episode. So I think it's a really useful thing to ask them to lie flat, and you often really very obvious if they've got a priapism, or, and specifically ask, have you got a pain crisis affecting your penis? Um, because we'll see it in about nearly a third by the age of 20 of the SSs in particular. So the initial simple measures which every boy and man should be aware of um, before it happens is that they can empty their bladder because a full bladder often prevents the, the penis from being able to um, empty. A warm bath, fluids, pain relief, mild exercise seems to create a sort of steel syndrome. So taking blood from the genitals to the um, skeletal muscles like that, like the thighs and, and buttocks. So things like squats or walking up and down stairs or jogging are quite common ones for the young men. Um, and then sort of supportive things such as hydration, pain relief. Then we've got etilephrine, which is an alpha agonist. It's very quick acting. So if men are using this at home, they've got to take it lasting at night or even ideally set their alarm for sort of three in the morning because priapism tends to happen at, at sort of four-ish. You've got that sort of peak of testosterone. So that's causing everyone's men's uh, normal morning erection. They're often got a full bladder at that time. They might have slightly low oxygen saturations because when we sleep, we have less sort of inspiratory effort. Um, so it's a sort of perfect storm that, that creates sickling within an erect penis so that it can't then drain. So the closer they can take the etilephrine to their expected time of priapism, the better. And it's quick acting, so they might need to take another dose uh, a couple of hours later. Worst case, there's things like aspiration or antiandrogens. So here's aspiration. If there's any men on the call, I can hear you wincing. But actually, 
the the chaps seem quite relieved when this is done. So they have a sort of penile block, so the penis is relatively less painful. And then you can see a needle going in each side to the corpora cavernosa and just physically draining um, blood from each side. And some of our men have had this done you know, 20 times. It's, it's, it's pretty difficult and, and devastating, and I'm sure makes their life um, very hard, uh, but it does prevent long-term damage. So if you leave a priapism for longer than about four hours, you risk permanent damage to, to that organ with erectile dysfunction and micro penis and scarring. And we have got about three or four patients who've had to have penile implants where they've had either sort of a bit like a metal tube placed each side which they can bend up or down or sometimes a little uh, chamber which can be inflated to make their penis um, erect or, or flaccid but I mean I'm sure nobody wants to go through any of that if it can be avoided. So aplastic crisis tends to only happen once in a lifetime. The difference here is that they don't have a high reticulocyte count so they're not churning out red cells because they've got a virus which has stopped red cell production temporarily and in most of us that just doesn't matter because we um, we produce cells which have a long lifespan and you know we, we wouldn't notice but parvovirus is that sort of slap cheek syndrome snotty nose red cheeks you see in kids if um, very common in the community and most of us will get it at some point in our lives so when our sickle patients get it they'll suddenly become very anemic with a low reticulocyte count and they'll 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 need a blood transfusion to get them through that episode but then they usually develop lifelong immunity after that episode. So sometimes in clinic we check their IgG, parvovirus IgG to see whether that's a potential. So I'm very nearly finished. So we've got sickle eye disease, a little bit like diabetic disease, um, which is um, little extra blood vessels forming at the back of the eye which can be fragile and bleed or pull the retina away and cause um, retinal detachment. So patients complaining of things in their eyes must always be listened to. We had a patient recently admitted who said there's a spider in my eye and everyone was like, oh, patients aren't they silly. But actually what he had was a, um, you know, a bleed, which just, they're often a bit speculated, did look a bit like a spider and, and they had, um, you know, they had a, a vitreous hemorrhage. So um, it's really important to listen to them, even if it sounds a bit crazy what they describe. It's very hard to describe symptoms sometimes when it's the first time you've had them. So important to um, refer them urgently to, hem to ophthalmology same day, particularly if there's um, flashing peripheral lights or loss of acute loss of visual field or a storm of floaters because that might be heralding a full retinal detachment which will result in permanent blindness in that eye. So if you can get them to the eye team they can often do clever things um, and prevent problems. So I think I'm going to end on sickle eye disease. So I suppose one of the key things is if you feel that one of your patients is getting sick really don't hesitate to call one of your haematology team. I know this is going out across the network but um, don't I, all the consultants would much prefer to be interrupted and hear about a patient who's desaturating you know with locks and saturations than to just um be left to have their lunch in uh, you know un, undisturbed any questions Are we allowed questions yes of course we've got 10 minutes of questions um please feel free if anyone got a question to ask um you can put it in the chat area. OK, well, Sarah, thank you. Your presentation was absolutely excellent. And um, I'm going to think of some questions for them if they haven't got questions yes, for me, because we don't want to run that ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, can anyone type in the chat? Uh, what they think is the most important part of the examination to be documented in the notes every single time you examine the patient. Go on, prize for the first person who can type in the chat what part of the examination is very important to, to write in the notes to document so that we'll know it. Yes, chest exam, excellent. Um, I I'm rubbish at pronouncing your name, but um, Osarenko is perfect, brilliant. Perfect. Pain is also very good. That's good. I suppose that's more often written in the um, in the flow sheet, but it's true. We always write uh, we always write pain. OK, next question. Um, if. Can anyone I'm trying to think of 
Can anyone think of a really simple housekeeping measure that might make patients feel happier on the ward? So something that even uh, the domestic team or, or anyone could do to make patients feel comfortable and sort of feel the love when they're admitted on the ward. Introduction, brilliant, well done. Water, excellent, perfect. Anyone think of anything else? Water, water, well done, all those people. Blankets, excellent, Clarissa. So we want heating, well done, Mira, and blankets, Sophie. So we want patients to feel warm. We want them to be hydrated. Introduction is excellent. So anything that can dispel fear is a really good one um, because you can feel much more relaxed if you know somebody's first name and, and you understand who they are. Sometimes we're not good at, we say, oh, hi, my name's Sarah, but it's important to know who you are. I'm the sickle consultant, you know, just, just to, to, to hear, um, who you are so they know what they can ask you. That's very good. Uh, Mandy Williams, attentive listening to their concerns is really good. Um, who can tell me um, what age do most people have their sickle cell diagnosed? Any, any results? Just type it in the chat. Six months, yes, we'd hope to get them a little bit earlier than six months. That That's probably what we would have done. Nowadays, every single person born in this country has a, a heel prick test carried out um, a few days after birth. And then they find out that they've, that's it, a Guthrie test. They find out that they've got um, sickle cell disease very early. So usually we want to try and identify patients before three months of, of life so before they've done their haemoglobin switch we want to know yep they've got sickle cell disease we've got the parents understanding what's involved they're having their um, penicillin we're getting going to get on with their vaccination so yeah newborn screening is a really important part that, that's comparatively new so um, don't feel bad if you put later because later is often when they might start becoming symptomatic um, in, and in countries that don't have a newborn screening um, that would be it but we hope our patients understand when they're new you know well not the obviously the baby won't understand but the parents understand when they're newborn actually sometimes we know that they've got sickle in utero can you think of how we could know they've got sickle even before they're born? Any little quick typing in the in the text. How could we know somebody has sickle cell before they're born? Bearing in mind we've got a sort of antenatal screening program. Can anyone think? So a significant proportion of our babies that are born, we know they're going to have sickle. Exactly, all perfect. So if we've if we've every woman who's pregnant in a in an you know in London, we would be having um sickle screen, we'll identify the parents of carriers, the parents will have been seen by the uh, community team to discuss their thoughts and would they like to have uh, prenatal diagnosis and then they can have had um, various ways of detecting it. So um, they can have chorionic villus sampling which is very early on so before they've told their whole family that they're pregnant they can have um, amniocentesis which is a little bit later and they could even have had extra brownie points for Vicky Robinson pre-implantation genetic diagnosis so parents where they both know that they have the potential to produce a child with sickle can have a sort of effectively like an IVF pregnancy and when the cells are just a t when the each embryo is just a little bundle of cells you can take one cell analyze it and only implant back the um, the unaffected embryo if that's your choice um, and you can potentially freeze others for another for another attempt later on for a sibling so pre plantation genetic diagnosis is great because you kind of probably in this that scenario though you wouldn't actually implant a sickle um, embryo although I'm sure it's been done if, if you don't get enough eggs and, and the parents make that decision good um, we have a, someone's put their hand up. Oh, yep. Go, go ahead, hand Would you person. Like to ask the question? Yeah, it was just a question, uh, question about the incentive spirometers. Um, what, you know, for people who are sort of, do, do we prescribe them or where do we get them from? It's just a person not too far from you. We used to have them on the ward where we worked before. And then at the last hospital I worked at, it was intensive care. Um, physios have them at our current hospital so it was just knowing where to get them from and actually physically give them to the patient so it was just so yeah no it's a good question. And how they we work, have loads really. and loads in our haematology wards in the cupboard that we can help ourselves to the cns team tend to carry a bag full of them round on the ward round um so that, i suppose they're the two commonest places to get them from it's not if you can't get hold of an incentive spirometer, what I've sometimes said to patients, um, particularly in other hospitals where they're not so readily available, is you can, you know, it's, we just want to inflate the lungs. So sometimes I just say, take a really big breath. 
10 times every hour. So it's not quite as good in the center spirometer, but essentially we're just trying to make them expand their lungs and that all that incentive spirometer is is just sort of you know showing them how far they've got and, and trying to make it a long slow breath so you can do it without an incentive spirometer if you don't have one available I think it's more important for the patient to know the idea is that they have to sit up and um, you know really try and expand their lungs 10 times every hour any other questions determined to take up every minute of my time. I've got until got, got 10 55. Yeah. So in two minutes, what other questions? You're all very good, very good at answering. I can see in the chat people are talking about research on maternal blood sampling. I mean, that research seems to have been going on forever and ever and ever. So I'm looking forward to it becoming established practice. But the idea that you can just do a single blood, simple blood test and say to a woman, you're carrying a, a baby with um, sickle cell disease or you're not. And, and that's the sort of holy grail really because who wants to have all these nasty invasive tests um it'll be lovely when that's properly embedded in in practice i suppose i'll just have a last little talk about hydroxycarbamide i personally think that that is really the basic um treatment for sickle cell disease and it's when I, I sometimes say to patients when they are really unkeen for it you know it's a bit like having diabetes and thinking I'll just wing it you know I won't bother taking treatment or having high blood pressure I'll just kind of face the consequences and I tend to say them, you know we're just going to watch the natural history we're just going to watch what would happen if we didn't have any treatments available which is which is really sad and sometimes the most effective way to make a patient take you know consider hydroxycarbamide seriously is to talk to another patient who's taken hydroxycarbamide and had a good, really good response. So it's good to have a little um, list in your mind of patients who are available to chat to other patients about, about things in general. We've got a couple of people who will talk about their hip replacement. Um, but yeah, I think hydroxy is a really good one. If you've got an enthusiastic, passionate patient who doesn't mind speaking at the occasional um, patient support group or ringing an individual patient who's really high risk and you'd really like to be on treatment, don't underestimate the power of, of peers um, over doctors. You know, they trust them more. OK, I'm going to finish. Brilliant. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your fantastic presentation. Thank you. So now running great on time. I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Kate Gardiner that will be talking about new treatments in sickle cell. Kate, are you there? Okay, I'll give you a few seconds. Maybe she's just getting ready to come on. Okay. I'll hold off for a minute or so and just see. She might be just getting ready to go. If you are there, can you put your hand up so I know? Okay. Right, okay, it may look like Kate is not able to join us um, at the moment. So, okay, let's go over to Dr. Heather. Are you around? Is there a possibility that you're able to do your presentation now, Heather? Oh, Kate's here? Perfect. Hi, Kate. Lovely to Hello. meet you. Hello. Yeah, Hello. I'll hand over to you. <laughs> Great. I'll just share my slides directly, okay? Yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Right. Hope you can all see the title slide. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So um, I've been tasked with um, talking to you all about new therapies in sickle. This is obviously a haemoglobinopathy study day, so I um, assume that you 
are all interested in sickle cell and um, it's a really exciting time to be working in sickle because there are new therapies around. If I was given this talk three years ago, even two years ago, probably even one year ago, it'd be a, a, a different picture we're portraying in terms of the management of sickle. So it's, a, it's an exciting time. My name is Kate Gardner and I'm one of the adult um, haematologists at Guys and I work in the, the sickle team. I guess just before we jump in at some of the, the facts and figures about the new treatments, it'd be worth stepping back and thinking about what treatment goals are in sickle. And of course, if you asked 800 patients like we've got in clinic and um, this question, you get 800 different answers. We'd have patients to be really keen to cure the disorder, potentially take any risks that that, 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 that might encounter. There'd be other patients who have a really high symptom burden, whether it's pain or fatigue, and um, want to reduce symptoms. Some patients' crisis really is the, the, the main problem and um, the unpredictability of crisis, the pain of crisis coming to hospital, that would be a focus, focus, focus goal. We've got other patients who actually don't have much crisis and they um, um, perhaps have a more hemolytic phenotype um, and they get really tired if they're really anemic because they're hemolyzing so much. Others, if they might have um, problems with organs related to sickle, whether it's kidney problems or heart problems, that might be a focus. Or rather than sort of thinking about the medical side of things, some patients might say, well, I just want to have fewer tablets, I just want to feel better. And I think they're all really completely justify different treatment goals for individual patients and it, it really just goes to show how varied this condition is and it's really important to um, make all these decisions obviously in collaboration. Okay so I guess the first question to think about is why do we need to present vaso-occlusive crisis that is pain events or crisis we use lots of words to describe that. Why do we need to prevent it? It's not just because it causes pain, but of course that is a really key thing. We don't want patients to be in pain and in actual fact it's not just about pain when someone's in crisis. Sometimes other things can happen that can be associated um, anemia and need transfusion. What happens if their oxygen levels are low? What happens if they've got an infection? Lots of things can happen in crisis that we want to prevent as well as the severe pain itself. But actually more widely, how frequently you have pain crisis is actually linked to survival. So the more pain you have, the reduced um, um, life expectancy you have. And we can see that nicely here in this Kaplan-Meier curve. So for patients who are having at least one emergency admission or presentation um, a year in black, they've got a reduced um, life expectancy compared to patients who are not having emergency admissions in the last year. This data is slightly out of date, but um, it, it proves an important point. So we've said frequent pain crisis is bad. What about the patients who don't have frequent pain crisis? Should they be rest, resting uh, happy on their laurels and they don't need treatment? Sadly, the answer is no. The sickle, as you I think know by now, causes lots of different problem, problems, both because of sickling, but also because of the anemia in lots of different organs. Um, and this is um, a big study looking at the prevalence of sickle complications um, in different groups. And what they've categorised it by here is how many pain crises a year. So in this first column, it's zero. And then it's um, up to one and then it's over one. And what we can see is all of these different organ damage problems, whether it's kidney related problems with albumin in the urine or renal failure or pulmonary hypertension, which can happen in sickle or eye problems, they've all got similar rates across um, the board, whether they're not having um, admissions or they are having frequent admissions. There's also a particular problem because of the hemolysis leading to anemia in sickle and that that's a problem for some specific organ systems, especially the heart probably. Having a chronic anemia causes um, cardiomegaly in, in all of us if we've got chronic anemia, irrespective of, uh, of the cause. 
the hemolysis part of the uh, hemolytic anemia can um, cause problems. It's releasing free hemoglobin. Um, so there's a pathway there where we're mopping up lots of nitric oxide and that actually causes um, blood vessel control problems. So um, that's why sickle can cause problems in lots of different organs as well as the actual vaso occlusion. So where are we now? So I'm saying this is sickle treatment in 2021. So last year, um, there's three sort of separate strands to, to therapy. In the blue circle on the top right, we've got penicillin and folic acid, which the majority of patients are on lifelong, keeping hydrated, holistic therapy. <coughs> and then the main tools in our armamentorium, which is really sickle specific treatment, is in the red circle um, and that's under prevention. And all we've had until recently is transfusion, mostly in the form of exchange blood transfusion in adults. And this is the machine you can see on the left. It's an apheresis machine or an exchange blood transfusion program machine. And that's um, where um, patients will have not just a normal transfusion, but blood taken off them. So we're exchanging their blood. You can see some bags of blood at the top there. If you've not seen this exchange machine, it's something to behold. There'll be lots of bags of blood up there and the patients will have um, blood coming out of them, perhaps on one arm with, with a big knees or going into the machine. All of the sickle cells are taken off, but the rest of the blood stays in the machine and healthy blood is given through the machine and then that comes back into their other arm. So it's this cycle um, of being exchanged, having the sickle cells taken off as well as having healthy cells transfused. So transfusion and regular transfusion for some specific patients um, to, to, to prevent lots of sickle problems. And then the other thing that we had was hydroxycarbamide, which has been around for um, well over 25 years now in clinic. And now we've got novel agents as well. So that's the sort of main thrust of um, um, treatments in 2021. The novel agents we had only got access to on clinical trials at the moment uh, in, in 2021, sorry. And I'll come back to those in the picture in 2022. And then the other thing is thinking about curative treatments, which I'll come back to. So I've alluded to this already, but a lot of the treatments based on the actual pathophysiology, what's going on in the body and, uh, and what we're trying to target with the drug treatments. And there's two big components to um, problems with sickle. One is this classical thing where we've got vaso occlusion and these rigid pointy sickle cells blocking up blood vessels. And that can cause things like acute painful crisis and chest crisis. It's actually not just sickle cells that are blocking it up. There's lots of things there. There's a whole inflammatory cascade, lots of inflammatory markers, lots of other cells as well, and the clotting systems um, flagged up as well. And that's important when we're thinking about how to target that as these downstream effects of the sickling um, with the inflammation, with the um, hypercoagulation. And then the second um, group, the, the, um, the pathway on the left, is the fact that these sickle red cells are a lot more friable and likely to break down. And therefore, um, we have what we call hemolysis. And this hemolysis is chronic hemolysis. So patients with sickle are always hemolyzing. And um, when they have a crisis, they often hemolyze more. So when you're hemolyzing, obviously your red cells are breaking down and your bone marrow tries to keep up to make more red cells, but it, it's generally speaking not good enough. And so patients with sickle are anemic. Um, they've also got all the breakdown products of hemolysis as well. So that's a different area to target in terms of um, sickle treatment. This is a complicated diagram, um, but it, it, it's not something we need to go into the specifics of. It's just thinking about how we can target treatment in sickle. And just thinking about the sickling itself, which we know starts off with the sickle haemoglobin and then the polymerization of this sickle haemoglobin forming the sickle cells. If we've got that as a target to reduce the um, polymerization of the sickle, to reduce the sickling, then that's uh, what we call a primary treatment. 
And then anything that's sort of happening downstream, if you like, whether it's all that inflammation um, cascade um, with all of the different adhesion molecules that we can um, talk about a bit more in a minute, or, or the uh, the clotting that gets um, activated. These are all downstream targets. So um, this is more what we could think of as secondary treatments. So I guess it might be worth thinking about some of the primary treatments. If we're actually stopping the sickling, stopping this polymerization of the haemoglobin S, stopping the red cells becoming sickle shaped, that's the primary problem in sickle, isn't it? And in some ways, that's where we might anticipate more global effects. Some of the things further down, if they're just targeting inflammation, it might not have benefits for everything in sickle, which is obviously a complicated disease. Everything I've said so far is, is just about treating sickle rather than curing sickle. We're now in the um, window where we can offer some curative treatments and I see this um, expanding in the next year or two. Um, and by curative treatment, I either mean stem cell therapy and there's various forms of that or gene therapy. OK. So um, when we're talking about treatments um, and clinical trials and thinking about the pipeline of things being developed in um, in research or in pharmaceutical companies, I don't know how much you're aware of thinking about clinical trials, but we have phase one trials, which are first in man or first in human. Um, we have phase two trials where we're proving it's um, safe um, and looking at effectiveness basically in a target population and then phase three trials are the big trials where we're properly assessing um, and quantifying how effective it is and looking for, for rarer side effects. So where are we now in terms of treatment in 2022? Well I've, I've listed things at the top which are curative treatments in green and those at the bottom which are general treatments to work to reduce crisis, organ damage and anemia in the bottom. Um, the place where we are now, where, oops, the place where we are now in terms of um, things being approved compared to last year is we've not just got transfusion um, and hydroxycarbamide, we've also got crizoluzumab which has been approved. We've got Voxellator available in certain circumstances on an EAMS um, license. And we've also newly got sibling specific stem cell transplant at the top. OK, so we're in a different arena, basically. We've got a lot in phase three as well. Um, and both kings and guys, um, both adults and paediatrics have lots of different um, studies open um, available to sickle patients. Some of them are targeting other things like pyruvate kinase, like the metavapit and nitavapit. Um, we've got a newer version of crizoluzumab from GBT called inclacamab, which is opening at Kings and Guys soon. We've got transfusion studies open at both sites, looking at transfusion in pregnancy. And then hopefully in the coming year or so, we'll have haploidentical stem cell transplants and gene therapy available as well. So it's really transitioning quite rapidly as um, um, drugs are going through this pipeline of trials and so on, going through the regulatory pipeline in order to be approved. So here's a picture of where we are with sickle treatment. So by that, I mean drug therapies, not curative stuff, not transfusions. We've got hydroxycarbamide. It's been around for 25 years. We've got crizoluzumab, also known as Adacvio, and we've got Voxellator, also known as Oxbrita. Um, just to go through what they are, I've done a picture of this. I often think it's helpful to see what a medicine looks like um, because it's a bit um, it's a bit uh, abstract otherwise. So hydroxycarbamide, as you know, is a, is a pill. It's a daily pill that needs regular monitoring. That's quite similar to Oxbrita, another pill which is daily that also needs, um, well, very regular monitoring. The middle one, crizoluzumab, is not a pill. It's an infusion, a monthly infusion. 
um, and I'll come back to all the practicalities of the chrysaluzumab and voxellator in a minute. Hydroxycarbamide um, does lots of things which are good for sickle, so to speak. It induces um, fetal haemoglobin, which basically means there's more baby haemoglobin or fetal haemoglobin and therefore less sickle haemoglobin and they're less uh, therefore less sickling. It actually does some other things as well with reduced adhesion, reduction in the white cell count, which is good for the um, downstream inflammatory problems in sickle. And that has a benefit in, for vaso inclusion in terms of reducing the frequency of sickling. It reduces the amount of vaso occlusion by about 44% in the original MSH trial. One of the benefits of having a drug around for a long period of time is we obviously know the more long term data, both in terms of benefits as well as risks. And so we know that there's a survival benefit with hydroxycarbamide uh, and possibly some renal benefits as well. So one of its focuses is reducing um, um, crisis, and that's really what it was sold on in the 90s and early noughties. But it actually also, because it's doing the primary problem of reducing sickling, reduces the amount of um, um, polymerization of the deoxyhemoglobin, reduces the amount of red cells that sickle, so there's less hemolysis, and that means the hemoglobin is increased on average between 10 and 20 gram, um, grams. One of the key concerns is around fertility and specifically thinking about um, both the risk of teratogenicity in um, um, in women um, who are to get pregnant, although that data is just from um, animal models um, rather than in human studies. The um, the other issue is the effect of um, the hydroxycarbamide on sperm quality and sperm count and that's why we recommend young uh, men and um, teenagers have their sperm banked just in case that affects them. For those it does affect, the vast majority actually normalise after it's um, stopped for a few months but there's rare occasions where a man's sperm is affected by hydroxy and it doesn't normalise so it's good to have some sperm bank on a just in case basis. And we all prescribe hydroxycarbamide in clinic very um, um, frequently. So moving on to the second column, chrysaluzumab, um, that's, um, like we said, an infusion. And the main focus here is data around the reduction in um, um, in the reduction in um, crisis. So. The way it's working is to be what we call a monoclonal antibody against P-selecting. That's a posh way of saying it's something that's really specific and targets the inflammatory molecule P-selecting um, to reduce the amount of it. So the way I describe this to patients is, like I said earlier, Sickling and vaso occlusion is not really just about sickle cells blocking up blood vessels. There's loads of stuff going on, other cells, but also inflammatory molecules. And one of the key ones is this P-selectin. So if you're trying to make a wall, I've never built a wall in my life, but let's say I am. I'm going to build a wall with bricks and I'm going to put my cement in between the bricks to make sure it's as strong as possible. If we use that as an analogy and say the sickle cells are the bricks and the piece selecting is the glue, the cement between them, you can imagine you've got a, a much less secure wall if um, you haven't got much cement. So this drug is taking away the piece selecting, so you're less likely to have vaso occlusion. And it's actually got similar um, efficacy to the hydroxycarbamide, hydroxycarbamide 45 percent reduction which what I say to patients is if you've had um, 10 crises last year on this drug you probably have um, five or six crises we haven't got any long-term data we're not expecting it to change anything in terms of the hemolytic anemia um, I'll come back to some of the side effects. Um, this is licensed now um, in the UK. There's a complicated application pr procedure, so we have to essentially refer to the regional MDM, get approval um, and fill in the relevant paperwork. Right. Um, the next one, the last one is Voxellator. So 
this is in a bit of a grey zone in terms of how we're accessing this at the moment, but um, we're hoping that it will be easily accessible next year. So this is a pill um, and its primary target is to stop haemoglobin S polymerization. So this is going back to one of those medications that's stopping the primary problem. They um, obviously had the primary outcome in the clinical trial, the main initial one was called HOPE, as a boosting of haemoglobin and a reduction in all the haemolytic markers and that's what it's done, although actually not quite as effective as, as hydroxycarbamide. Like I say, the way we've accessed it until, in fact, Friday just gone, the 14th of October, it was on an early access to medicine scheme, so it's pre-licensing, it's just going through all the regulatory paperwork now. Um, and so we would have to do applications again locally and then via the EAMS um, portal to, to document these patients. So I guess it's worth thinking about who, who, who this is for. Then to crizolizumab, patients who have lots of pain, frequent pain, um, voxelator, patients who've got problems with anemia and perhaps they can't be transfused for some reason. So just thinking a bit more about that, crizolizumab, like we said, it's a monthly infusion. And actually, that's a really important point. Um, a lot of our patients are quite young. On average, the, um, the, the age of a sickle cohort in a lot of clinics in the UK is in the late 30s. So often people are working or they might have childcare responsibilities. So adding an infusion on may be fine for some people, it may not be fine for others. So they need to come to the day unit regularly every four weeks for the infusion. And that there's not something where they would, um, um, it loses its effectiveness if obviously patients don't turn up um, regularly. I guess the other practical point there is that they need IV access, which of course in a condition where patients have been bled regularly throughout their life, that can be challenging sometimes. And we've had to put a pick in a couple of patients. Crizolizumab can be used with or without hydroxycarbamide. Um, and in fact, in the STAIN trial, um, the subgroup on hydroxy um, was um, that the effectiveness was better than the ones not on hydroxy. It's, it's available to anyone aged 16 plus um, and have had two or more sickle crises in the previous 12 months. Importantly, that doesn't have to mean two or more hospital visits because, of course, the vast majority of crises patients tend to manage at home. And we, we, we did a review of our cohort, I guess for adults, that probably means about a third of patients overall um, are eligible for crizolizumab based on two or more sickle crises a year. They also have to have um, their labs checked and um, their kidney function has to be adequate. And they have to have regular bloods, which happens fine if they're having regular cannulas. In terms of side effects, I guess, especially as nurses, the, the, the key one, which is in common with other monoclonal antibodies, like rituximab, for example, is an infusion rela related reaction. That's kind of like an allergic reaction that happens while the infusion's going in, often halfway through the 30 minute infusion or just after. So we actually um, have to keep an eye on the patients. They can't go as soon as the infusion has finished. We need to keep an eye on them and their Ob straight straight after. It can be just a rash or a bit of itching, sort of typical allergy symptoms. Sometimes it's more um, serious, um, um, swollen mouth, um, um, and there's even been rare cases of anaphylaxis reported. Obviously, it depends on the severity as to what we need to do. Stopping the infusion, giving them anti-allergy med medicines is the first step. We have had this um, occasionally, but patients have been able to then restart. And we haven't had anything where patients have had to stop so far at, at guys. One of the other things that can happen to sickle patients in an infusion related reaction is it can actually get sickle pain. Um, so it's really important we go through this in detail when we're consenting patients um, so that they know what to, to report. And then there's some more non-specific side effects that I've listed there. 
normally the infusion related reactions or pretty much always infusion related reactions happen on the first or second infusion so it doesn't tend to be a problem where people have been fine for six months and then suddenly they get one right that's it on crizaluzumab thinking about voxellator now then we, we've said it's a daily tablet again that this can be with or without hydroxycarbamide and the eligibility here is it's a slightly younger age um 12 plus and they need to have a hemolytic anemia although that's quite a um a liberal hemoglobin cut off and they need to have some explanation as to why the hemolysis is a problem so they've either got a hemolytic phenotype and they're untransfusable or they're very symptomatic to their anemia or they've had a poor response to hydroxycarbamide and yes it's a tablet that they can take daily at home but it does need to have close blood monitoring in terms of side effects the key ones are actually related to the gi tract so um, it's not uncommon to have diarrhea abdominal pain and nausea um, that tends to disappear in most people after a couple of weeks. And um, what, what we've actually started doing here um, is starting people on a smaller dose and incrementing up to try and avoid the side effects. Just a bit more on Voxellator. So remember, Chris was that anti-crisis, if you like, um, um, medication and Voxellator helps boost the haemoglobin. So this is a slide that gets bandied around a lot when um, we're talking about clinical trials and VOX. Um, what you can see here on the Y axis is the haemoglobin increase. In the red, we've got placebo. In the dark blue at the top, we've got what is a standard dose of Voxellator. And in the middle with a pale blue, we've got a smaller dose of Voxellator. So what you can clearly see here is that the haemoglobin goes up in a dose dependent way with voxellator treatment pretty quickly and then is sustained over the following 72 weeks. Okay and that's great isn't it? I mean we don't obviously just want to improve haemoglobin but um, fatigue um, was improved as well um, and obviously the longer term goals would be to have an improvement in um, or less of a reduction in cardiac problems, renal problems and all the other things associated with anemia and hemolysis. OK. Right, so the other thing we've thinking now instead of the treatment side of things, thinking of the um, 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 transplantation, I've just looked at the time, so I'll, I'll go through this quickly because this is not my area of expertise, but we've got sibling donor transplant available at King's now um, as standard of care on the NHS for very specific um, patient groups, like you've had a, a stroke, for example, or on a transfusion programme, and it has to be accepted at the National Haemoglobinopathy Panel. This is a high, um, obviously high benefit, it's curative um, treatment, um, but they do, uh, th there are risks, both of morbidity and mortality. This is just for sibling donors. If, if patients do have a, um, a sibling donor, haploidentical, so half donors, which might be your mom or your dad or your kid, are in an experimental phase and we're hoping to open a trial next year. Right. So, Carol, I've got five questions now. I don't know if people want to write things in the um, um, in the chat box. Um, okay. I will do these quickly. What do you... What do you think would be good for these these patients? This is patient one, a 50 year old man with SS. He's um, got increasing pain. He's also got increasing anemia. When he was young, his hemoglobin was 80. It's now more like 70 at baseline. And he's getting he's getting quite tired as well. He's not on any treatment at the moment. What do you think might be good? I can't see the um, chat box. Please feel happy to um, put your answer in the chat box. So Nazik and so, Sophie HC. So hi, hi, uh, the hydro. Hydrocarbamide. Yeah. Yep. So he's not on anything at the moment. This is potentially going to benefit both his pain and his haemoglobin. Great. Well done. Next patient. 
young woman with SS, haemoglobin's 90. She gets frequent pain and she's had three hospital admissions in the last year, not got any evidence of organ damage and she's already on a good dose of hydroxycarbamide. What do you think? We got through in the um, chat room, we got e exchange transfusion and we got Chris and Nem, I haven't pronounced that word, but the Chris and medication. It's a loser, I call it Chris. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, no absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. I think exchanges could be an option. Um, what we're doing now with these patients is um, suggesting crizolizumab. We often do exchanges if there's um, um, a longer history of frequent pain um, and maybe lots of acute chest syndromes as well. Next one, young woman with SS. She's had a stroke. What do you think she should have? Someone's poor EBT or uh, exchange. Great. Anything else? Everybody's saying exchange at the moment. That's brilliant. I'm really glad to hear that. So, I mean, this is this is a, a take home message of the whole day, I hope. Sickle patients need to be transfused unless they've got some funny transfusion problem, which is some patients. Stroke equals transfusion in sickle. And then after that's delivered acutely, regular blood, tra blood transfusions afterwards. I guess there's a part B to this, isn't there? So in patients now, we've got, oh, that should say transplant, not transfusion. Um, in patients who've got a matched sibling, um, they would be eligible for a transplant if they've had a stroke. So we could consider a sibling transplant. Last but one patient. So this is a 55 year old woman who's got SS. It's pretty low haemoglobin, isn't it? 50. She doesn't really get any pain. She's got pulmonary hypertension. She's got chronic kidney disease. She's had a transfusion reaction and she's already on hydroxycarbamide. Any thoughts? We've got one in the same box. Brilliant. Great. It's really hard to get feedback. Um, when you're doing a, a lecture from your office. So uh, this is really good feedback. I think you're all listening. Perfect answers, 10 out of 10. Last patient. Young woman with SC. She's got a haemoglobin of 110. She's not got any sickle pain. In fact, she's never had a crisis and she's not got any organ damage. Again, we've got a box. Okay. So I've said none. So we would generally offer hydroxycarbamide to everyone with SS and then a small minority of SCs who are getting frequent pain. She's not eligible for VOX because the haemoglobin's too high and she's not eligible for CRIS because she's not getting frequent pain. She's obviously not got any organ damage, which would mean she'd go on a transfusion programme. So she's not eligible for everything now. I think that's a point in itself. We've got a lot of patients, a third of patients are on nothing. But I, I'm i seeing, and I'll come back to this now, um, um, a picture where potentially we will start some patients on treatment now to try and prevent them getting problems rather than waiting until they've already gotten problems. OK, so fine. So future directions. These are obviously really exciting times for sick. We've got novel agents, but we've not got long term follow up. Um, and this data, these data are all in the context of clinical trials. So it's going to be great to get more real world data, longer term follow up to know about longer term benefits for organs, to know about um, longer term side effects. This idea of having sub phenotypes in sickle and which treatment is going to be best for who. And, and potentially multiple treatments. So um, do, do some people need to be on quiz and box? And can we identify patients early before they get the kidney damage and they need the treatment, but to give them the treatment up front? We've just also touched on stem cell transplants. Um, I haven't said anything about gene therapy because it's not available yet, but that's a curative treatment we're hoping to be available in the next couple of years. 
that is it. Thank you, Kate. That was a fantastic presentation. And anyone like to ask any questions? I know we're kind of maybe just three minutes. So any questions? OK, OK, well, obviously you've done a, a lovely job. Thank you okay. very much, Kate. OK, um, nice to be here. Thank again, you for inviting any, me. Any question, please put it in the chat group. So now we're going to introduce Dr. Heba. Hi, Heba. Lovely to see you. And I'm now going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. So my name's Heather Rawl. I'm um, a clinical and health psychologist in GSTT adult um, sickle cell team and we cover the whole of haematology at GSTT. We've got a, a small team of psychologists here um, and I'm going to talk about the psychological aspects of the patient's experience and also implications for healthcare professionals. So what I'd like to do is ask Lily to share a video um, of uh, a patient. So this is one of our patients who talks about their experience and it's about 10 minutes long and what I would do is invite people to imagine you're in the room here with Keith and he's talking to you directly. I know it's really tempting maybe to to do something else while the video's on but but I think he, he makes some really good points right from the beginning. So um, over to the video and then I'll come back in after the video's finished. Thanks Lily. I'm 47 and have lived with sickle or known that I've had sickle all, all my life. So as far back as I can remember being a toddler or you know being a young infant, I knew that I had this condition. So, and back then you weren't generally expected to live or the word was that you weren't gonna live beyond your twenties. So growing up and living with that, especially my early years was really difficult. Um, I tried to fight against that as much as possible in terms of, I was like headstrong, I was like, well, doctors don't know how long I'm gonna live. They say I'm gonna be, I'm not gonna be here beyond my, much beyond my twenties. I'll show them, so to speak. Um, but in the back of my mind, that was always sort of there. So I guess, when I would had crisis or when I was in the hospital, I would do my best to just carry on and everything. But at the back of my mind, I used to often think, is this it? Or is this gonna be the time that I don't actually get out of here? Mm -hmm. So kind of living with that and living with that in the back of your mind isn't very easy, but you kind of carry on and do the best you can. Um, I guess that's the way that I, I dealt with it. I mean, I was quite fortunate that I guess in my early years, I suffered quite a lot, say from birth to probably about nine or 10. Then I seemed to, sickle seemed to ease up and I didn't seem to go to hospital that much. And so from about age 11 through to about 17 or 18, I think I only went into hospital once. So even though I went to clinic appointments and stuff, it felt as though sickle was, and I had pains at home, but not bad enough to take me into hospital. So it's almost as though, oh, maybe I've outgrown it. And I knew, knew that I hadn't, but I guess it was wishful thinking. But then in my late teens, it seemed to creep back into my life. And then that's when I really started to, I guess, fear it, but at the same time, ignore it. And I know that seems like a contradiction but that's how it was because I guess I wanted to live life and do everything the same as everybody else. Like my peers, I wanted to go out, I wanted to chase girls, I wanted to go out clubbing, I wanted to do everything that they did. But at the same time, I had this shadow of, I guess I also had this shadow of trying to cram everything in before I dropped out, so to speak. Even though I didn't really want to believe the doctors or I didn't want to say or give in or anything, that shadow was always there because it was still kind of like unscripted that, you know, sickle cell patients or people with sickle are expected to 
to not live much beyond their 20s. Yeah, and there were some very dark, dark times when my early 20s, when I was going into hospital a lot. I mean, sort of going into hospital for, say, maybe a week or two weeks, being out for a week, going back in for another 10 days, being out for two or three days, going back in, doing that and trying to hold down a full-time job. And then at age 22, just short of my 23rd birthday, my daughter was born. And I guess that was a major changing point for me in terms of that psychological thing that I had of, well, not being here much beyond my 20s. I was like, I've got to be here as long as possible. Even though I was in and out of hospital a lot, my goals were to be there for her first day at school to be there for when she was in her first school play. All the milestones that any other parent has, I had those wishes and wants. And when I was going through some of my darkest times of sickle, I say having my daughter to think about helped me pull me through. And yeah, so I guess that's certainly the first half of my life with sickle. I say the second half, more recent half of my life, yeah, it's changed. It has been difficult. There has been a lot of challenges. There are still challenges, different challenges, but I've learned to deal with them in different ways, I'd say. Mm-hmm. There's certain nurses on certain wards that I remember now, and I'm talking about, I haven't seen them for like 20, 25 years. And I often wonder what what they're doing, where they are, hoping that they're still in nursing. Um, yeah, there's certain nurses on certain wards that I, I really think of with with great fondness. Yeah. And just for meeting them and knowing what their characters are like and knowing that without sickle or without this condition, I wouldn't have met such people. I remember this particular episode where I think I'd been in hospital for about three or four weeks, mm-hmm. and I'd gone home, thought it was better, the team thought I was better and everything, and I ended up being back after being home for like 12 hours. The pains just came back in a really severe way. Mm-hmm. And I just be, remember being at my lowest ebb because that also coincided with, I just split up with my girlfriend, my, my daughter's mother felt despair and I just really thought where do I get the energy to fight all of this that's going on in my life at the moment but Neil kind of came and he spoke to me and he was like you know you have to it was a pep talk he sort of gave me and he was like you have to start listening to your body and what's going on and but he actually pulled me aside and had a conversation with me Nobody has spoken to me like that on a on a level, on a on a personal level that wasn't family or a friend like from school that I'd known. And that had a profound effect because that just showed me that it went beyond the job for him. Going forward from that exchange, it was almost like there was a newfound understanding or a deeper level of understanding that transcended just patient and nurse practitioner and I will be forever grateful for that particular pep talk. One challenging experience I can remember was um, being on one of the wards and when I have morphine as a painkiller I itch terribly after having maybe like three injections I will itch and want to itch to draw blood unless I'm given a certain um, anti-allergy tablet. And by this point, it was deemed that Puriton wasn't good for me to have with morphine because the two of them suppressed my heart levels, heart rate too much. So it was sort of like expressed that I shouldn't have Puriton and I should have another anti whatever it is. but it was still on my notes for some reason or a set of notes. 
So I was on the ward and I tried to tell this particular nurse that, you know what, no, that's a, yeah, it's on my medical charts. I've just gone onto the ward, but no, I can't have that. I'm supposed to have something else. Um, it's not quite decided yet. Um, and I just refused to have it. And the nurse could see me having my painkillers and see me itching and sleeping and itching in my sleep. And actually woke me up out of my sleep to say, you know, have a period on, it will stop you from itching. I can't sit here and watch it. And I was like, no, I can't have it because it, and I told him why. It felt like badgering me. And I guess from what he could see, and even though I'd said no several times and the reasons why, I just wanted to be left alone. And I ended up just sort of like saying, oh yes, just to kind of shut him up. And I ended up taking it. Cut a long story short, one of the doctors that had seen me earlier must have walked past my bed at some point later and I must have been barely breathing or you just see, saw that something was wrong. Apparently, obviously I'd had a reaction and, you know, the amount of morphine I'd taken and Pyroton, my heart rate had suppressed quite a lot. I was barely breathing, mm -hmm. but that was all out of not listening to me. So essentially, I would say just to adhere to my care plan and as well as those things that you said, such as, you know, treating me as a, an individual, listening to me. Um, and that's not because I want to bark orders or anything like that. It's just a case of I am a specialist on my condition and I'm not going to do anything to endanger myself. I don't want to be in hospital if I'm in hospital. I want to get out of there as, as quickly as possible things are in place, sometimes doctors or nurses do feel that they do or they're going to do what they think is the right thing as opposed to what is written down for me. And like I say, the team has prepared quite an extensive care plan. So therefore, even if you don't know how to care for me or if you're, an emer if you're like an out of hours doctor, there is a plan for me specifically that says how I should be cared for. And that should be adhered to. And it's really frustrating when, for one reason or another, the hospital staff decide not to do that and think that they know best. Living with sickle is, isn't easy. It is a very complex disease or disorder. My experience of it is very much different from the next person's. And it is such a, a disorder that, you know, how it affects me affects the next person totally different. And the next person after that differently, and again, differently. It's challenging to have, so I can only imagine it's, it's challenging to treat. Um, but in saying that, it helps if immensely, if, I'm treated as a human being when I do need treatment from hospital staff, even though there have been great strides and a lot of things that have changed for the better in the, what, 45, 46 years that I've been coming to hospital and 40 years specifically coming to, to St. Thomas's, to guys in St. Thomas's, my treatment. Um, yeah, there's still work to be done. Okay, I think that's quite powerful stuff that Keith talks about. He covers a lot in those 10 minutes, a real flavour of what it's like to have sickle cell and also what an impact healthcare professionals can have on him, both positively, but also sometimes not so helpfully as well. So I'm just going to share my slides and I just ask people to just stay with their thoughts at the moment, just to have a bit of a pause and notice how you might be feeling now, having watched that.
OK, what do I need to do to get my slides up? Um, you were just doing it, just click from the beginning and from the beginning. Yeah, yeah it was showing fine. Oh, was it? OK, it looked really strange from mine. OK, yeah. so you can just see one slide there, can you? Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK. So I guess the other thing just to have a think about is what could be important to a person diagnosed with sickle cell when being cared for by helping services. I think Keith touched on that quite a lot. And also anything that you would do differently, more of or less of when caring for someone with sickle cell, just bearing in mind what he said. And maybe for some of you, this is really familiar and for other people, it might be quite new. So just having a little bit of a think about that. And I think some of the things that really struck me was how he talked about he wasn't expected to live beyond his 20s. Um, when he's in hospital with a crisis, he might think, is this it for him? It can affect him differently um, at different phases in his life. He might have periods of time when he's not having many crises at all and other times when he can be quite unwell. Um, living with the shadow of sickle cell, he talked about fearing sickle cell and at the same time trying to ignore it. Sounds like that could be really challenging. Being in and out of hospital at the same time as holding down a job or trying to be the best father he can be. And it was interesting to hear what he said about what pulls him out of dark times. So for him, it was thinking of his daughter. And then I heard him talk about positive experiences, the impact some of the nurses had on him. 20 years later, he still wonders how they are and how he had a pep talk in one of his darkest times when he was in despair. And that really helped. And his, one of the negative experiences was about his care plan not being adhered to and, and potentially then caused other problems for him. And I heard him say about expectations, but what he would like from staff would be adhering to a care plan, treating him as an individual, listening to him and working with him because he wanted to get out of hospital as soon as possible. And his final thoughts were that it affects people in different ways. He said it's challenging to have, so I can only imagine it can be challenging to treat. Wanting to be treated as a human being and there's still work to be done. So just to sort of summarise some of the things that he did talk about there, there's all sorts of things that he mentioned, but also what other patients of ours say as well. And here's some other quotes from other patients about what it's like to have sickle cell. And these aren't unusual. This is what we hear over and over again in our work as psychologists working with patients and hearing about their experiences. And people have also talked to us about challenges in care. So um, some of the things people have talked about, particularly around being in hospital, would be things like um, finding it hard to get their painkillers when they feel like they really need them or getting a sense of when they might be able to have them being placed under cold air vents in wards um, and how that can increase their risk of, of getting a, uh, the crisis being made worse, having access to extra blankets and fluids. And just a sense sometimes that there, there may not be a joined up approach between the doctors or nurses or between the different teams. We all know that that can easily happen. And also our patients have said that when there's been highly publicised cases of people with sickle cell um, having died and that's in the media, then of course that's going to affect how they can feel coming into hospital. And we're also mindful of the power of language, um, just thinking about how patients may be talked about and also the words that are used that I think as doctors and nurses and also just general healthcare professionals, we get really used to talking about things in certain ways, kidney failure, losing blood, cells breaking down. But people can tell us that it can really lead to um, images in their mind and um, make them feel more anxious about what might be going on. 
And we all know what it's like on a hospital ward in ward rounds where we can perhaps talk about patients as if they're not really there or um, having a sense that just because a curtain's closed, um, it, it means that somehow there's a very clear sort of hard boundary around what we're talking about. So some of the common challenges that people may face with sickle cell um, were touched on by Keith, but also there's some others here. Um, so what our patients might talk about is how the impact of their experience of racism, perhaps, or feeling like their disease is um, stigmatised in their communities um, can have an impact on how they feel about their sickle cell and just and, and the stresses that they experience in day to day life. So we've talked a bit about in various teams about um, inequalities in general health care, racist practices in health care. So, for example, people with sickle cell aren't entitled to free prescriptions. Um, there seems to be less investment in research um, and, and effective treatments compared to other areas of health. So we're just really mindful of this and, and how that can be experienced by people who are also then dealing with their health issues. Keith talked about his fear of death and, and the very real fear of death. And then also on here, I've got from birth, so they have an experience again and again and again, having multiple hospital admissions or the same old conversation with nurses or doctors and psychologists, the same old complaints that may come up or the same concerns that they can be having over and over again. All of this can really take its toll on, on people. So the impact that this might have on how somebody presents in hospital, how somebody feels, we sort of think about some of these experiences as being quite traumatising. And so we, we think about something called a trauma informed approach. And this is when we can make sense of how people present, how people behave as survival responses rather than seeing it as challenging behaviour or symptoms. So the idea is, is that people may be more vulnerable to becoming really stressed or really anxious or perhaps really just shutting down and becoming attached because of the multiple experiences of the traumatic experiences over time. And we know that a lot of our patients may have had prolonged stays in hospital, had experiences in intensive care, been told that, that they may die um, or have experiences where their family have witnessed and being incredibly unwell and being worried that they might have died. So this is a real threat to people and um, people can experience, yeah, uh, that is being traumatising. And every time they come into hospital, then they can feel that is re-traumatising over and over again. So this slide really shows what might be happening for somebody with the the sort of the leafy green bit is how they might be presenting. So somebody may be quite mistrustful or seem to be avoiding appointments, may be declining treatments that other people think are a really good idea, may seem detached or maybe really distressed. There may be labels attached to some patients or that, that patient's quite difficult. And I guess what the roots show is everything that can be going on that isn't immediately apparent to the healthcare professional who's being faced with the patient. So all of their experiences that they've been having to date, the things that they've experienced which have contributed to how they might be feeling in the present moment, how the analgesia may be affecting their cognitive processing, maybe they've had um, a stroke and, and that's affecting how they could be processing information. So some of the other things that have come up for us is just thinking about what might be going on for somebody um, if they don't seem to be able to accept help in the way that we would hope that they would. Um, and sometimes if people feel really low and worthless, it might be because they've experienced a lot of rejection in their life. They may feel like they're not good enough to be around. They may, as a result, push others away, come across as quite aggressive. They reject other people's help because they don't trust that it is really there for them. But then as a result, they can 
be left feeling isolated and vulnerable, don't feel like they can cope, start letting other people co um, come close again, but then find that their expectations may not be met they get let down and then they feel rejected again. So here's just one example of how we might see what might be going on if, if it feels like somebody can be quite hard to help. And we know that can feel quite frustrating for staff. Something else that comes up a lot is about pain management and um, sometimes problems can arise in the hospital around this. And the way that we tend to see it is, well, are these problems coming from some sort of drug seeking behaviour? Or could it be something that we could see more of as a, a pseudo addiction? It's caused by under treatment of pain and ineffective pain coping strategies. So, for example, what might happen is somebody could be in hospital, they have pain, they ask for medication. Um, the staff might question this, they might dispute it. The patient doesn't feel believed. The patient then panics and they thinking, OK, I really need to convince these people that I have pain. And so they may then exaggerate um, their, their pain behaviour and then that may then make the staff think, oh, OK, well, that person definitely isn't much pain because there, there's just something bizarre is going on here. And then the patient may feel so desperate that they end up self-discharging, um, leaving the hospital abruptly, avoiding the teams. But what we notice is that when we can really look at this and, and really properly control pain, effectively treat it, then some of these apparent drug seeking behaviours can diminish. That's just one thing that might be going on. Of course, sometimes for, for a very small proportion of patients, there may be drug seeking going on for other reasons. But what we know is for the vast majority of our patients who are asking for painkillers, it's because they are trying to manage their pain. And I guess a tiny proportion of people where it can be really time consuming and distressing um, is more memorable to staff. So these these are the instances that people think about. So I guess in these scenarios, we're just thinking when this sort of things happen, what judgments are going on for staff? Could it be that staff could think, well, are these behaviours a patient's attempts to manage their pain? And if yes, what is it that we would do differently to support them? So focusing on their pain and analgesic needs rather than a focus on, well, that person's obviously addicted to drugs and they don't really need it. Something that um, Keith talked about was a care plan and something we do in the sickle team is when there can be issues arising around um, supporting somebody to, to cope where they're in hospital or um, manage effectively, we might expand that medical care plan to include more about um, boundaries um, to their care in order to maintain their safety. So that might be including something about um, aiming for consistency for messages, for uh, consistent messages to patients and staff, noting that patients and staff have responsibilities and really being clear about expectations around how people should conduct themselves um, on the wards. And I guess what we know is for some of our patients who come in in, hos in hospital quite a lot, um, there can be a real opportunity to make a difference for them. And I guess what may, might be helpful for us to think about is what can staff do to make a difference and, and how can staff um, support our patients? One of the things is to notice how we feel as healthcare professionals, maybe while we're in the room with a patient or afterwards, it may be that we can feel really quite frustrated and annoyed um, if a person is repeatedly asking us for help, but, but maybe not taking it up in the way that we'd like them to. It can feel really hard to tolerate um, some of the really strong feelings that, that people show. In um, psychodynamic theory, it talks a lot about something called projection or projective identification, transference, counter-transference. What it's really talking about is that sometimes people can give us their feelings that they can't tolerate because they're just too overwhelming. So sometimes we might notice we're with a patient, they're, 
they? They're seeming really, really helpless. We end up coming away feeling really helpless and despairing. Um, and that can sometimes be a clue to how the patient's feeling. We might have an urge to rescue the patient or fix their problems, or we might have an urge to get away from them, avoid them. Um, and it could be that in this scenario, we're being pulled in, into a particular role. So we've all had experiences growing up, um, reverting to, into um, a particular way of doing things. Maybe we've always been the rescuer or, or the problem solver or the fixer in the family. Um, and when things can be, be quite stressful, we can get pulled into that role again. So, and I think we can see that around us. Sometimes some of us end up trying to fix people's problems for them. Um, rather than empowering and enabling somebody to, to support themselves. So I guess there might be something about just noticing how we're feeling when we're with a patient and just being curious about it. It can be a clue to how they're feeling, but it also can raise questions about, well, actually, what feelings belong to me? What's that about? What might be belong to the patient? And what's, what clue are they giving me about how, what's going on for them? So there's a real hope that we can have trauma-informed services. And, and what this means is when an organisational and individual change process with an increased awareness of how trauma can negatively impact on people, and it then can focus on adapting practices to prevent re-traumatisation within services. So what does this mean in practice? And I think this is a really key slide to think about what we as staff can do. Um, whatever staff there may be in hospital caring for our patients, whether they're people with sickle cell or not, but particularly I think some of these concepts relate to people with sickle cell. And it, it seems really helpful to think about these as maybe sort of core themes. So how we can help people feel safe in hospital, how we can help them um, feel that this is an atmosphere of trust where, where we can be trusted and they can get trust in, in the hospital system and in the healthcare professionals. Um, giving people choice, collaborating as much as possible and then empowering people. So the sorts of things that this might include are helping patients to become emotionally and physically safe. That can be done by just really simple things like are, are things really well signposted? Do people know where they're going when they're in and what what the room is um, about where they're going to? Um, how to get to places? Are areas welcoming? And then also as individuals, what we can do, are we really actively listening to patients' concerns and trying to suspend judgment as much as possible? Are we making care predictable? We can do this through communication. So we all know how powerful it can be for patients when we just give them an update about why there might be a delay in something, particularly in getting pain medication. Patients tell us it makes all the difference when they just get um, are kept informed about this. Um, we can give clear and consistent boundaries to patients about their care. So sometimes um, we can see that different healthcare professionals might say different things to a patient about um, about an aspect of their care. It can get quite confusing. Um, and can we be really respectful to the patient and really sensitive to, to where, to their identity, their age, their gender, their culture? In terms of trust, um, patients tell us all the time that they just want people to be honest with them because at the end of the day, a lot of our patients do have a lot of expertise in coming to hospital, dealing with healthcare professionals. Um, and they might be a bit more mistrusting than other patients, perhaps, because they have had experiences um, where promises have been broken or things haven't worked out like they've been told they, they would work out. Um, being mindful of a patient's journey, I suppose, that's just really about being mindful about how somebody's history and experiences can affect how they are in the room with you at this moment. So maybe having a mindset of 
what's happened to you rather than what's wrong with you or what's your problem. And avoiding jumping to conclusions and making assumptions. This is all really hard when we're in such a pressured environment and, and we might be feeling pretty stressed and under pressure ourselves. It's very easy to jump to conclusions. Um, giving people information about their options, their rights and time to consider these. Um, is really important about people say, you know, they want to have choices in their care. And sometimes it, it feels like we um, think we're giving somebody a choice, but actually we're not giving them all the information they need to make a choice. Um, Keith said, you know, just work with me on this. I know a lot about my condition, so I, I can help you get me out of hospital quicker. Um, and just really bearing that in mind. And then finally, empowerment. So rather than us going in rescuing, problem solving for patients straight away, validating what strengths they've got already, what resources they've got already, what they know about things already and building on this. And also, of course, being mindful about the language we use and how, how that can be shifted to be more empowering to patients. And then finally, what patients have said they find helpful. So I think this is touching on some of the things that have been said already. Um, following care plans if they have one, taking their pain seriously, listening to them when they voice concerns, treating them as an individual, trying to give pain relief promptly, but giving them information about why there might be a delay. Um, asking them what helps them normally. And they also say that um, sometimes they might have had the experience where it's turned out that the sickle team haven't known that they're in hospital, for example. So just sort of doing the obvious things like that, it sounds like it's really helpful from their point of view. So this is a snapshot of our psychology team. We've had a couple of changes since then. Um, but like I said, we work across haematology at Guy's and St Thomas's, and there's also um, Giuliano at um, King's, who leads the psychology service there in, in Sickle Cell. Thank you for your attention. I don't know if we've got time for any questions. Thank you very much, Heather. That was absolutely an excellent presentation. And what was more excellent was hearing from the patients, hearing his voice, how he felt, and how we can, as a health professional, give more support to the patients. So just putting it out there, is there any questions? Um, we still got a few minutes before we go for lunch. Okay, no questions, no thoughts. Okay, but I want to say thank you. The one thing I, I would like to ask Heba, um, yeah. obviously being in sick for many years, um, which is quite sad because if you go back to many years ago, all those things have changed, but we're still at uh, that area where there is a thing about stigma and it, I feel that we've come so far but we have still hit a block and I was just wondering what 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 is the thought what what is it about um, individuals or health professionals that we are not hearing and I just want to know what your thoughts were um. or is it about we're not here we just might be again about a lack of knowledge and understanding? I guess it's to do with lots of things isn't it? I mean I know that there's been quite a bit of research on stigma in um, related to people with sickle cell and um, uh, there was some research done in our department several years ago and what was interesting was is that people still felt stigmatised when they came into hospital, which was quite a surprise to us. We thought the stigma would be appearing when they're disclosing to um, people at work, maybe, or, or in education. But there still is a stigma. And I wonder whether part of it is to do with that, um, the health inequalities that we see. Yeah. Um, 
And we know from the um, all parliamentary report um, that really highlighted health inequalities. Um, so, yeah, it's it, it feels like it's really multifaceted, doesn't it? It's it's partly maybe coming from communities, but also just coming from the, the system as a whole um, about how sickle cell is perceived. I think we, we've still got a lot of way to go and I think it's still a lot of challenges. Um, we've got, can we just say, what are some of the things that we can do to help those patients who find it difficult to open up and trust us? Yeah, and I think, I mean, will people get access to the slides, Carol? Um, I believe so, yes. Yeah. It'll be on the um, YouTube and their S and uh, their website. Yeah, because I think that the, so the slide that I was showing that had those five principles, how to how to make sure that services embody uh, like safety, trust, choice, collaboration, empowerment. So with a bit about trust, what I talked about there was about keeping promises, I guess, and being honest as much as possible to patients because they come in because they have so much expertise, they come in again and again. They can tell if somebody's bluffing, I think, and pretending to know something, and they really, really appreciate it if somebody says to them, well, tell me about how you like to be supported, or, you know, I know about this, but but what do you think? Um, is there a care plan that they can they can go to to help support them? So I think it is about that honesty and it's building a relationship. So our, our, like Keith said, he really remembers some of the relationships, even though they might have been quite fleeting yeah. that he had um, when he came into hospital. So it's all those very basic things that we all take for granted, but which can be really hard to do in a pressured environment when we're feeling under stress. There might be yeah. staff shortages, staff might be asked to maybe to you know take on positions that are not feeling quite comfortable with because of the, the staff shortages but at the end of the day like Keith said just treating him as a human being um suspending judgment and, and doing that active listening can be so helpful yeah. well, I think what you said is absolutely imperative and um been within sickle for many years that is one thing that the patient always actually talked about was about the trust was about actually I know when the staff is bluffing I know when a, a staff is not actually being honest and I think the key factors to take today is about just be honest just just say if for what for one example um if you're a nurse on the ward and a patient um needs to get their medication but unfortunately you can't get to that patient on time go to the patient let the patient know i'm really sorry we are short today but i will be coming mm -hmm. things like that it's just about as you clearly stated just be open because mm -hmm. this group of patients they rely on us Mm. And we are their voices and if they mm. don't feel that we can be trusted for that that's the issue there, mm. there is a, a a wonderful message here from nicola thank you so much for that thought-provoking session i work as an amp in a and e and this session really brings home that i need to be there for the patient in crisis and support them more despite um pressures and and that alone speaks it all so thank you very much heather it, as again it was a lovely fantastic presentation and um thank you for everyone this morning i've you know we've had a wonderful program and i hope you all taking in all, all the learning all the knowledge that are really important and um, now we begin off for lunch and um in the afternoon the next person i'll be chairing will be our fantastic dr sarah stewart smith and um thank you all and please don't forget about um, doing up the evaluation as we go along. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carol.